So I'm going to talk today about scaling UX, or how I learned to love, wor stop worrying and love the bomb, which is waiting for perfect opportunities to present themselves. So this talk is for everyone in this room. It's not for UX people specifically. It's for developers, it's for designers, it's for CEOs, it's for content strategists. What we're going to talk about is some kind of smaller techniques you can use to bring better user experience practices back to your business. So I've seen a lot of UX presentations that have like build, measure, iterate with kind of like big arrows pointing around in circles. And I don't think you can go back on Monday and say, hey, boss, we're going to change everything. We're going to have great UX. All we need to do is build, measure, and iterate. Done, right? It's not going to happen. So what is UX anyway? So when I need to find out when, what something new is, what, what I do is I search the web. So I use the Google. So I, I Googled UX. I came up with these Venn diagrams, which I, I promised you in my, uh, my uh, speaker notes that I'd have Venn diagrams to make me look smart. So user experience as the confluence of art, psychology, and science. And that sounds really powerful. But I, I thought art was supposed to be like transforming and transfiguring up your mind. You're not supposed to really understand it right off the bat. And science, well, I think most people in this room might argue that UX is pseudoscience at best. I hope I'm not going to offend anyone there. And how many psychologists do we have in this room? I think one, and I know her. So <laughs> maybe two, OK. No, I, I don't buy it. I don't think this works. How about this one? It's a little bit more complicated. There's a little bit more going on there. But they have design and interface design. And if you need to like, add an extra petal to your pretty flower just to like, make it look right, then you're not doing UX right. All right, how about the, I'm not even going to get into the levels of bonkers that this is. I think it says information design twice on there. So this is the best Venn diagram I found to explain user experience. It's kind of mysterious. We don't really know where it comes from. A lot of people come up to me and they say, I know good user experience when I see it, but I don't know how to make it. Well, hopefully today we can kind of get through some light techniques to figure out how to make it. So, Here's my definition of UX, but it's just for today. You know, um, just for this talk. This doesn't encompass everything that user experience is. But I think it's a set of tools and practices to interact with users, discern their needs, test their motivations, and gather feedback. And then a collection of techniques to translate that feedback into products that users can delight in. So actual tools, sticky notes, Sharpies, cards, what I call big boy sticky notes, and paper. And we'll probably use all of them today. So the business comes along to you, it's Monday morning, and they want you to build a new feature. And Airbnb is popular right now, and so is Uber. So they came to you and they said, oh my gosh, I have this amazing idea. We're going to rent cars to people through a website. But the cars are not going to be owned. They're just going to be owned by the people. And you can just share them and rent them. And most businesses kind of follow a practice like, let's do some research. Let's do, write some requirements, do some design work, and then develop the feature. Here's a month to do it. Make it work like Apple. And that's just kind of untenable, but that's often kind of the, the situation that we're forced with. So my hope is that I can show you some techniques, and we're going to move on and get, jump right into those techniques. Um, I won't be able to go in total depth on any of them. We have a lot to cover. So I'm going to kind of give you a broad overview of something that might work running alongside of what you do on a daily basis at your job. So week one, I'm going to use weeks as an arbitrary time frame here. I don't presume to know how fast or how slow your business develops software. This is kind of month one or year one where I work. But uh, we'll go with weeks. So when the business is doing research, what we're going to do is make a UX project plan. And that's different from a traditional business plan. What we want out of a UX project plan is just kind of a general, OK, we had four steps. They said have it done in a month. Let's break it down to like what kind of things we can do each week so we can kind of move the user experience ahead. So estimated duration of things, some of the output we'll be doing, and then who's involved in each step. And kind of just jot this down so you can frame out the practice that you're going to do. And to get um, your project plan started, you should do a listening tour. And a listening tour is walking around your organization, walking around a bunch of cross-functional teams, and asking them what they think about this feature, you know, 
air be an Uber, however we want to call it. And what are the different aspects of it? Find out who the stakeholders are, what the market strategy is, and why people care. Why would someone actually want to use this product? Talk to QA, talk to developers, talk to the CEO, and just jot these things down. So jot them down on Post-it notes with a Sharpie. We'll, we'll tell you why later. So ask about the strengths, the weaknesses, and the desired outcomes of what we want this feature to be. And outcomes is a little bit different. So the business is often asking for output. Hey, give me this feature at the end of a month. It's going to be awesome. We're going to sell it in the marketplace. Where an outcome is a little bit different, it's the change in user behavior we want to see by building this thing. So we're building Airbnb Uber. And what we actually want to do is rent people's cars. We don't want to bring a product to the marketplace. So ask about outcomes. Next on our listening tour, what you're doing is you're also establishing some UX is happening. You might not be a UX person, so you're just walking around like, hey, I'm interested in UX. Let me tell you a little bit. Why don't let's talk about it? And you can establish what you find valuable so that you can kind of start to talk about UX techniques like valuing communication over process, valuing collaboration over deliverables, and valuing iteration over following kind of building to specific dates. But above all, on this listening tour, listen and take really good notes. So I, how I remember it is um, you want to take notes on a sticky pad with a Sharpie. So I say, small squares and carry a big tip. So I think someone famous says something like that, all right. So why you're using a, a, a big tip in a small square is the fidelity of the information you want to capture. So if you have this big piece of paper and you're writing all these notes, you're never going to be able to go through them. You're never going to be able to organize them. You just have this big mess of loose leaf pages that you're going to forget, kind of like a PDF. But if you have a bunch of stickies, you can easily organize them, and you can easily just capture the information that's important. So now that we have all these stickies that have kind of aspects of the features, desired outcomes, strengths and weaknesses of other products on the market, we're going to organize them. We're going to look for patterns. We're going to combine ideas that can be connected to the outcomes we've heard. And we're going to map out the priority, or what we think the priority is. So one way to do that is something called a Kano or a Big Bang scale. So let's draw this here. In a Kano scale, what you're looking at is at the top, this is delight. And this is my favorite thing. This is disgust. You actually disgust your users. Over here is like, eh, I wouldn't miss if it wasn't in the app, uh, application. Over here is, it has to be in the application. And there's some things that are disgusting that have to be in the application. EULAs. Um, you know, there's some things that are delightful that don't really need to be in the application, like animations of little kittens or something. So for bang versus buck, it's the same idea. This is kind of how much of an impact it's going to make. This is how much it's going to cost. So like indoor jetpacks would be like right around here or something. But you're doing this UX kind of alone so far. You've done this tour. You've talked to a lot of people. You've shared a lot of information. When you start to organize these stickies, grab a couple friends. Get their input, kind of and organize them in a way. If you can't grab a couple friends, do it in a public space. So kind of like hang it on the wall on the way to the lunchroom, and then remind people as they walk by, like, hey, remember when we talked a couple days ago and you told me that the most important thing of Uber being Airbnb is that we have a really smooth login page? Well, look, I kind of organized it. So that's a, that's a pretty important thing, just kind of in the scope of all the features of everyone I've talked to at the business. So this just is a great way to kind of start conversations about how the organization is thinking about products. But we don't build products for organizations, do we? We build products for people to use. So our requirements are being gathered while the business people are going off and writing out their kind of six nested deep bullet point lists. We're going to go do some user discovery work. So we don't really have a user discovery team, so we're going to use guerrilla tactics. And one guerrilla tactic that's great for user discovery work is called goob, or get out of the building. So we have a big list of features, of outcomes. Organize a bunch of questions around these features and outcomes that you want to ask actual people. Then go out on your lunch break and ask actual people. First of all, 
explain why you're there. I'm not from a scary cult that I'm going to convert you into my magical, you know, purple Nike Kool-Aid drinking spaceship. I'm just here to gather a little bit of information on the app we're building from that place down the street. Remember we sponsored the Jazz Fest last year? Ask open-ended questions. So what's the most important part of Air, Uber, b and to you? Get them talking. Use whys and hows, not dids and was when you talk to people. Talk about past experiences. Say, have you ever rented a car before? Have you ever used Airbnb before? Get them talking, and then get them talking about your specific features. Allow silence. Ask a question. People aren't, they have to intake things. I mean, a little too much silence, they might start to think you're like a creepy person just staring at them waiting for something. So allow enough silence for them to think about the question and answer it appropriately. Keep them talking. So tell me more is a good phrase. Well, how come? What's the reasoning behind that last thing you said? Those are always good ways to just keep people talking. But above all, listen and take good notes. If you can't talk and take notes at the same time, bring a friend with you. Buy them lunch. Say like, hey, we're just going to go out and talk to a couple of people on the street. We're going to, I'll buy you lunch afterwards. Sure. Hey, can you take notes for me too, oh, by the way? Sure. It's kind of creepy what we're doing. Sure. <laughs> But once you start to do it, it becomes, it's actually pretty fun just to walk up and talk to people. And, and people are really excited. Another technique is to kind of like list out all the features on note cards, like five of them, hand them over to the person you're talking to, and have them like rank, priority, sort them in some certain order from like most important to least important. And that's just a good exercise where you don't have to talk if someone's a little bit more like quiet about like, well, I don't really answer your questions. That gives them something to do and use their hands and kind of takes the uh, focus off of them and onto the cards but it gives you a ton of valuable information. Um, also, if you approach people on the street with two people, it's less intimidating than one. You know, kind of if you kind of walk up all confident as an individual person to start talking to someone on the street, they might get a little bit weirded out. But two people, it's just like, hey, you know, we're asking for directions, we're lost. Actually, let's do some user experience. <laughs> You'll find that a bunch of the things that you thought were awesome that were in this category totally fall flat with the people when you talk to them. So don't get too connected to your ideas. When you talk to users, you have to change your expectations. Don't throw away any ideas either. You just talk to a handful of people. That's not like actual user research you just did. It's kind of what I like to call best foot forward filtering. That's trademarked, by the way. I trademarked it last night. Not really. But. So, we ha now have a better idea of like how to attack our product. We have kind of a rank order of features and outcomes we want because we've talked to people. But the other thing we got out of this is we gathered potential user data. So if this is a little weird, you can't get out on the street. You don't want to go out and talk to people. There's other ways to kind of get the same amount of information. Probably everyone here is on Facebook or Twitter. Just make like a Google serve form survey and like send out a blast. Like if you were making an app about engagement rings, Facebook's the perfect place to like send that out to. I think that's why it exists, is just to post pictures of engagement rings now. I don't know, I haven't been on it in a while. So gathering user data and potential information, that is the bread and butter of kind of user experience. You're on to your like, first step of being like a real UX person, because what we're going to make next is proto-personas. So proto-personas is just an easy way to think about users and to kind of frame conversations about who you're actually building products for. So you get to draw the same diagram for a proto persona as you drew for your Kano diagrams or your bang versus buck. The only difference is that you're going to number your quadrants. So if you can draw a plus and write four numbers, you too can work in user experience. So don't confuse proto-personas with real personas. Personas are kind of like a hallowed thing in UX. So this is a fancy stereotype, for lack of anything else. It's just a way to kind of think about people and get other people on your teams thinking about people. Again, once we make our personas, put them out in public, and you'll start referring to them. Oh, you know what? Jack is really going to hate this feature. Oh, you know what? Sven's going to love it when we build this. So the first quadrant of a proto-persona is you do a little sketch. And you write a name. This is going to be Sven, I say. If you don't like to sketch, you can kind of like, you know, use other techniques. I like to kind of get my inspiration from 1970s minware. 
and just kind of other, you know, there's like beautiful techniques of just like thinking about real people who exist today. <laughs> so after we kind of get a sketch and a name, what we want to write down is some demographic information. So these people were really into the 70s. That means they're probably broke and can't find work. Um, we'll say they're 27, because that's like a 70s hipster age right now. I don't know. So third, after demographic information, you want to write some pain points that this person might have. Since they're broke, they don't have good credit, so they just use checks. They pay for everything with checks. And half of their checks bounce, but it doesn't matter. And then you want to say, what are some potential solutions to these pain points? When we're talking about potential solutions here, it's not solutions to the problem that you're trying to solve by building Air, Uber, X, BNB, whatever we're calling it. It's solutions to these pain points. So keep it really simple. They need to use checks. Your solution is accept checks. And if that goes into your product or not, who knows? But it's a way to think about this person. All right, so we've built product personas. We're on our way to doing user experience. Remember, hang these around the office, get your friends talking about them, share these ideas. Week three, this is when design's happening. This is when the requirements have been thrown over to the wall and kind of PSD factory starts to happen. So while PSD factory starts to happen, we're gonna think about hypotheses and wireframes. So a way to write a hypothesis statement is pretty straightforward. You just say, we believe that building this feature Uber, Airbnb, I need to come up with like a real name for that because I keep on saying it different every time. We'll call it Uber BNB. Um, for these personas, we've already done our work. We have features, we have personas, and we have outcomes. So we just write it up in kind of this, this phrase. We believe that building Air, Uber, BNB for Sven will achieve more weirdly illegal car rentals. <laughs> and after we have hypotheses, we're gonna make a bunch of these for all the different personas and all the different kind of features we have. We're gonna do something called a design studio. And a design studio is really, really fun. I've done a number of these and I've never done a bad one. So this is the first kind of point where you're asking for like time from the business. We need two hours of people's time. You want developers, you want designers, you want QA, you want the CEO, you want users if you can get them. And you gather them all together in a room and you explain these hypotheses to them. You act as the moderator. Keep a really tight schedule, though, because this has to, you have to whip through these, these design studios. Explain the hypothesis. Explain your personas. Then give them five to 10 minutes on a, with an eight up. An eight up, all it is is you take a piece of paper, you fold it in half, you fold it in half, you fold it in half again. OK, so you have to fold three times if you're a UX person, not just twice. And you have eight quadrants of a piece of paper. Ask them to draw little sketches of what they think this might look like this feature that you just subscribed to them in the hypothesis. And everyone's gonna be like, oh, I don't know how to draw, I'm so bad. No, this, oh, I, you know, ooh. If you can draw a circle, a triangle, and a square, you're doing better than HTML. You need to do some like fancy CSS tricks to draw a triangle. So that's the kind of fidelity we want here. Then give everyone two to three minutes to kind of explain. People are gonna be like, well, can I like make it a workflow and do like one like piece? Yes, you can. What if I only get six done? That's fine. But you know, what if I want to do you know, like every different things and draw puppies in the last one? That's fine too. Give everyone just time, two to three minutes, to talk about what they're going to do. Then you're going to do two ups. And this is where we start to steal ideas from each other. Or glean, I guess that's what you say in polite company. Glean ideas from each other. Where a two up is just one, two. So people have heard what everyone else has to say and starts to kind of filter down these ideas. Keep it constructive, keep it lighthearted, do the feedback session again, and then time permitting, break it into two teams and have people use big boy sheets to draw out kind of what the outcome of all these different filtered sketches are. Now we're really getting into the meat and potatoes of what makes or breaks a good UX person, wireframes. But your work's just been done for you. All you have to do is like take so wireframes, you do them to like build, um, like, ev what's that word? Everyone getting along. Build like a consensus and to communicate ideas. You just had your team build consensus and communicate ideas. So all you're doing is kind of boiling that down into a wireframe. 
But here's some tips. I've made a lot of wireframes too that just have worked for me in making wireframes. Clarity over visual design. When you start to worry about the roundedness of your corners, you're doing it wrong. At the same time, use a consistent style. If you're going to use a one pixel border to say that's a box, use a one pixel border everywhere. Use actual content. If you don't have the actual content, go find the actual content. If you can't find the actual content, guess at the Bex proximity. It will serve you so much better later on. Annotate. A wireframe that's just a picture is no good. It should have a big one in the corner and then like a thing that says one. Well, this login is like, well, it flips over here. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Credit your inspiration. You just did a design studio. Say like, this idea came from, you know, Joe designer. This idea came from, you know, Janine developer. Wireframes are not to be fussed over though. They are to be thrown away. Don't work over them. Show them to people. Show them halfway between. Kind of get people thinking about them. And know when to stop. If you keep on working over and over and over on a wireframe, then you've done too much. I'm probably running out of time here, aren't I? I'll whiz through this last section. OK, I'm going to whiz. Well, wait. <laughs> so week four, the, the high fidelity mocks are done. But you're also handing your wireframes over with those high fidelity mocks. So you're kind of communicating UX at the same time the kind of traditional business process is going along. What we're going to do this week while development is happening is validation. You're going to have plenty of time during this. You're just going to be able to sit back and relax because you know developers. So while we're relaxing, let's look at our hypothesis statement again. This actually isn't a very good hypothesis because if you think back to second grade math, you're not measuring it. Hypotheses have to be measured. So a true hypothesis, you state that we believe by building this feature for these personas will achieve this outcome. We'll know it's true when we measure it. And there's a lot of different ways to measure things. You want to try to get quantitative and qualitative measurement on all your hypotheses. That's not possible all the time. So you know, quantitative is you can, if it's say like, well, we want of our feature is to reduce bounce rate. Okay, that's the kind of a thing. You could talk to people about like, well, why did you bounce here? Well, you know, yeah. So that's actually a good one for qualitative and quantitative now that I think about it. Um, use Google Analytics for quantitative. I've looked at so many products on the market that you can pay for and not pay for. Just start with it. Trust me. It's free. People in your organization know how to use it. It's gotten a lot better in the last couple years. There's a ton more features in it. But use it in a specific way. Track to your outcomes. Make specific dashboards about what you're trying to track. And avoid KPI phishing, or another word I just uh, trademarked, phishing. And what I mean by that is like <laughs> tracking everything and then kind of going in a month later and being like, well, look, you know, on Thursday of the third month of being used, it dropped off really heavily. Well, let's make specials on Thursdays now. That's not what you need to actually kind of track to your specific outcomes and ask questions being like, are we seeing the increase in performance that we want? Send your metrics in, filter it. Google Analytics does this all magically for you and creates a dashboard. For your qualitative first step, ask a developer to watch someone else use their product without talking and without mansplaining. And that doesn't, that's not to imply that all developers are men. Women can mansplain too. You won't believe how much information comes out of this little thing right here. Like, but wait, why didn't the big button's green? Why didn't they click on it? And it kind of, developers will start to kind of rethink the interfaces that they're building. building. So next steps, it all depends on what kind of budget you have. There's a lot of different things you can do to do user research. We're not going to be able to have time right now to, for me to cover. Um, I just want to say Keynote, the Mac app, is really great because you can link between slides and it works on an iPad. So that's really great for getting out of the building. You build it on your, uh, your Mac and then you kind of go out and you have people actually click through it. It's a super quick way to build a prototype. So just remember these last few things. There's no magic silver bullet to solve UX. You have to do what works with your organization and work with what you have. Learn from your mistakes, take risks, validate, iterate, so that bubble is kind of true, but just do it in your head. Don't try to change your organization. And you aren't the first person to do this. Follow best practices. Look at the web. Talk to users. Have your teammates talk to users. Have your teammates talk to your CEO. Have your CEO talk to users. 
You get the point. The only non-negotiable UX process is communication. The easiest and most effective way to scale that process is to make it a bunch of other people's problem. Thank you.